Hello, and welcome to History 300, the origins of the First World War. Lecture 21. Germany declares war on Russia and France. August the 1st to August the 3rd, 1914. It was now Saturday, August the 1st. Austria was at war with Serbia. Russia had fully mobilised. Austria had decided on full mobilisation too, but being Austria, had not actually gotten around to doing very much about it. France, and then Germany, had partially mobilised. Britain had partly mobilised its fleet. In Paris on the morning of the 1st, Prime Minister Viviani was under pressure from the Army Chief of Staff, General Joffre, to declare full mobilisation against Germany. Viviani would not immediately accede to this, but he agreed to revisit the issue later in the afternoon. The German ambassador called on the French Prime Minister around lunchtime to ask what the French planned to do if Germany and Russia went to war. France, he said, will act in accordance with her interests. By four o'clock that afternoon, the French government had made up its mind. The placards announcing general mobilisation went up around Paris. In London, the British cabinet remained deadlocked as to how to proceed. On one side, there was Asquith, Gray and Churchill, the interventionists. On the other, still staunchly for neutrality, John Morley, John Burns, the president of the Board of Trade, and, albeit to a more ambivalent extent, David Lloyd George, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. The dilemma was that both sides were, in a manner of speaking, threatening to commit political suicide if they did not get their way, and they would take the whole Liberal government with them if they did. If Gray and the others could not get Britain to commit to intervention on France's behalf, they threatened to resign. On the other hand, Morley, Burns and Lloyd George threatened to resign if this happened. If either set of these resignations occurred, it seemed unlikely that the Liberals would be able to stay in office. And if the government fell, there would be a constitutional crisis. Probably the opposition Conservative Party would become the new government, which no one in the cabinet wanted. So it was hard to see how the Liberals were going to avoid self-destruction on this issue. The one possible way out was Belgium. The non-interventionists were dead set against any direct military assistance to France or Russia. However, the British government knew, partly because of Bateman Holweg's admission of this to the British ambassador Sir Edward Goshen in Berlin a few days earlier, that Germany was probably about to attack France via neutral Belgium. Fighting for France was one thing, but fighting to defend a small, neutral country like Belgium, a country which Britain was committed to by treaty, was another. Now this is not to say that the issue remained settled. What would happen, for instance, if the Belgians allowed German troops to pass through their country without resistance? Britain could hardly be more Belgian than the Belgians, as Asquith put it. Or what would happen if the Germans only invaded a small corner of Belgium? Would it really be worth going to war over a technical violation of a few miles of Belgian territory? There remained no consensus about either of these possibilities. However, so long as the Germans obliged the Hawks and the British cabinet by invading France via Belgium, it might be possible to raise enough righteous indignation in the Liberal Party to push through a declaration of war. Liberals disliked the idea of intervening in a continental great power struggle but they disliked even more the idea of international law being broken. In Berlin on the morning of the 1st, the Kaiser's ministers were awaiting a response to the ultimatum that they had sent the Russians the previous day, demanding that the Tsar cancel general mobilisation. The deadline was at noon. As lunchtime arrived, there was no word from St. Petersburg. Resigned now to the likelihood of war with Russia, Bateman Holweg went to the Bundesrat, the upper house of the German Reichstag, to request formal approval of a declaration of war against the Tsar's government, as he was constitutionally required to do. This he got with unanimous agreement. The German ambassador in St. Petersburg was cabled a copy of the declaration of war and told to deliver it to the Russians at five o'clock Berlin time, unless he was told otherwise. The afternoon passed with no word from St. Petersburg one way or the other. As five o'clock approached, the Kaiser signed the order for general mobilisation. It's worth recalling at this point that even though the Germans were declaring war against Russia, they had no intention of actually attacking the Russians for some considerable time. One might wonder then why they insisted on being the ones to declare war, the only practical effect of which was to make them look like the aggressors. 
The answer is the tortured logic of the Schlieffen Plan. The German army plan, remember, was to invade France. But Germany and France still had no direct quarrel on August the 1st, 1914. A reason had to be concocted to justify attacking the French. The only possible reason was the Franco-Russian alliance. The Germans had to argue that once they were at war with Russia, it would only be a matter of time before France came to the aid of its ally and attacked Germany. So the Schlieffen plan could be framed as a preemptive strike against a likely opponent. This meant, though, that the Germans were declaring war on one great power, Russia, in order to justify declaring war on another one, France. German military planning had tied up German diplomacy in knots. The Schlieffen plan had been concocted in the first place because of the German obsession with the idea that if they ever went to war with Russia or France, they would end up having to fight both. In the event, it ended up guaranteeing that this would happen. Just a short while after the order for general mobilisation went out, there was an astonishing development. A message came through from Prince Lichnowsky, the German ambassador in London. Sir Edward Grey had apparently made an amazing offer. Grey had said that if Germany only attacked Russia, Britain would not only remain neutral, but it would guarantee French neutrality as well. The effect of this bombshell cannot be overstated. Suddenly, it seemed that the British Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs had rescued the Germans from their own folly. The Kaiser ordered champagne to be brought out. He turned to Moltke and told him, Now we can go to war against Russia only. We simply marched the whole of our army to the east. Moltke almost had a nervous breakdown. Spluttering with anger and frustration, he insisted that the Kaiser did not understand the implications of setting the Schlieffen plan into motion. There was only one set of mobilisation instructions. They could not simply be torn up and rewritten on a whim. Every last detail had been worked out over hundreds and hundreds of pages of movement orders. If the Kaiser ordered the army to turn around and attack Russia, the result would be chaos. Germany would be left defenceless. Was this actually true? After the war, when the German army's head of transportation heard this story, he was so irate that he wrote a lengthy account for a newspaper, insisting that, yes, he could have improvised a new mobilisation plan on the fly in August 1914, at least if he'd been ordered to. He had a large staff that was well trained for such expediencies. We know, too, that in practice the armies of the great powers were able to make emergency redeployments at times without losing their coherence. For instance, in September 1914, when Paris was in danger of being encircled by the Germans, the French were able to successfully move large numbers of their troops northwestwards to remove the possibility of being outflanked. This doesn't necessarily mean that Moltke was lying on August the 1st, however. He may simply not have appreciated the ability of his staff to come up with a new solution. Or he may have spent so long thinking about the Schlieffen plan that when the moment came, he couldn't possibly conceive of it being scrapped. Whatever his reasoning, the Kaiser was having none of it at that moment. According to the timeline of the mobilisation plan, the first German troops were supposed to enter Luxembourg at 7 o'clock that Saturday evening to take over the Little Grand Duchy's railway network. It would be Germany's first overt act of aggression. Wilhelm ordered Moltke to cancel the movement into Luxembourg. Moltke was appalled, but he finally agreed. The order arrived at 7.30, too late, as it turned out, to stop the first German troops from entering Luxembourg. Sheepishly, they had to retreat back across the border. The Kaiser then sent a telegram to his cousin George V in London, asking him to confirm Gray's amazing offer. The answer arrived later that evening. It did not have the message the Germans wanted to hear. The British monarch explained that there had apparently been some kind of misunderstanding. The proposal that the Germans had described was not, in fact, on offer. We still don't really know exactly what had happened. Either Lichnowsky and his determination to secure British neutrality had misunderstood something that Grey had said, or else Grey had said something without thinking through the full implications of what he was proposing. Either way, it was a bitter blow to Wilhelm and Bateman Holweg. The Kaiser turned to Moltke and shrugged. Now you can do what you like, he said. Moltke wasted no time. The invasion of Luxembourg, which had begun at 7 o'clock and had been cancelled half an hour later, now took place a second time. It was now Sunday, August the 2nd. All eyes were now on London. In the British capital, 
the French ambassador was furiously berating Sir Edward Grey to make a decision. Ever since 1905, the British and French had been making detailed plans for military cooperation in the event of a war with Germany. Yes, admittedly, there had been no formal defensive treaty, but there had been a strong understanding between gentlemen. This was as much about honour as it was about legalities. Were the British going to act disgracefully and leave France in the lurch at its moment of greatest danger? Grey, of course, was still unable to commit to much of anything without the backing of the rest of the cabinet. All he could offer, and he was doing this without the approval of his colleagues, was to promise that Britain would protect the French Atlantic and Channel coastlines from any German naval attack. If you recall, the French and British navies had previously divided up responsibilities between themselves. The British had agreed to handle the Channel and Atlantic, and the French would handle the Mediterranean. The French ambassador was hardly satisfied by this half-commitment. He continued to press Grey to do the honourable thing. Or else, he insinuated darkly, no one in Europe would ever trust the British again. The French did get one bit of good news on Sunday morning. In Rome, the Italian government informed the German ambassador that Italy re intended to remain neutral in the unfolding war. Italy, remember, was a member of the Triple Alliance along with Germany and Austria. But as the Italians pointed out, the Triple Alliance was a defensive alliance, and it was Germany which had declared war on Russia on Saturday, not the other way round. The terms of the Triple Alliance were therefore irrelevant to the conflict that had just broken out. In truth, the Italians had lost all enthusiasm for the Triple Alliance a long time before, and probably would have come up with some reason to get out of their obligations, whatever happened. But the German declaration of war against Russia offered the perfect legal excuse to do so. Italy's decision to remain neutral had major implications for France. It meant that the French army units located on the Italian border could now redeploy northeastwards, strengthening the attacking force that was on the brink of invading Alsace and Lorraine. In London, the cabinet was meeting to continue their discussions of the previous day. The news of the German occupation of Luxembourg the previous night strongly hinted that an invasion of Belgium would be next. Prime Minister Herbert Asquith summarised the situation as he saw it. Legally, Britain didn't have to do anything for France and Russia if they were attacked. It had no treaty obligations to either. It might have to do something for Belgium if it was attacked, although this wasn't clear. The 1839 treaty guaranteeing Belgian neutrality could be interpreted either as Britain having the duty to prevent an invasion of Belgium, or merely having a right to prevent one if it so chose, a right which it could, in theory, decide to waive. But either way, Asquith insisted to his colleagues that the decision should not get bogged down in legal technicalities. There were bigger issues at stake. Whether or not Britain had to intervene, it was strongly in her interest to do so, in his view anyway. A German victory over France and the demotion of France from great power status would be disastrous for the balance of power in Europe. So too would German control of the Channel ports in northern France and Belgium. Simply for its own self-preservation then, Britain could not stand by and let either of these things happen. But despite Asquith's argument, the non-interventionists remained unconvinced. A collapse of the Liberal government appeared imminent. In Brussels that same afternoon, however, events were now unfolding which were to resolve the deadlock in London once and for all. The German ambassador had been sent a set of secret instructions on July the 29th, which he had kept in his safe ever since. Now he was ordered to open them. They told him to present an ultimatum to the Belgian government at 7 o'clock that evening. French troops, the ultimatum said, inaccurately, had begun passing through Belgian territory. The Germans demanded a right to respond in kind. The Belgians had 12 hours to agree to allow German forces to pass through their territory unimpeded or else face occupation. In London, Asquith mobilised the British army. It was now Monday, August the 3rd. All Sunday night and into Monday morning, the Belgian King Albert I met with his ministers to decide how to respond to the German ultimatum. Belgium's small army was no match for Germany's. On the other hand, however, the Belgians had a series of powerful fortifications which would, at the very least, impede the passage of any invading German force, and they could expect quick assistance from the British and the French. Ultimately, it came down to a matter of dignity. 
Were Belgium to accept the proposals laid before it, the official response to the Germans read, the Belgian government would sacrifice the nation's honour while being false to its duties towards Europe. Albert's government ordered that tunnels and bridges on the German frontier be immediately destroyed. It decided, however, to wait until Germany actually invaded before formally requesting help from the signatories of the 1839 treaty. In London, the news of the German ultimatum to Belgium broke the deadlock in the cabinet. One member, John Burns, had already resigned the day before, and another, John Morley, decided to resign on Monday morning. But crucially, David Lloyd George had decided, after much wavering, to abandon the non-interventionist side and go across to the Hawks. Once Lloyd George abandoned Burns and Morley, their resignations became far less important. The cabinet was finally agreed. If Germany invaded Belgium, Britain would declare war. It was now up to Grey to inform the House of Commons of the government's resolve. He spoke at three o'clock that afternoon to a packed chamber, the fullest it had been since 1893. Grey said... I ask the House, from the point of view of British interests, to consider what may be at stake. If France is beaten in a struggle of life and death, beaten to her knees, loses her position as a great power, becomes subordinate to the will and power of one greater than herself, and if Belgium fell under the same dominating influence, and then Holland, and then Denmark, then unmeasured aggrandisement would have won. The House erupted in cheers from all sides. For the Irish nationalists, John Redmond announced that the government could freely remove every British soldier from his country, which had seemed just a few days before to be on the brink of civil war. His followers, and those of his opponents, the Irish Protestants, were now happy to set aside their differences for the duration of the European conflict and unite behind the government. It was, as Gray put it, the one bright spot in the whole of this terrible situation. At six o'clock that evening, Germany declared war on France, citing attacks by French troops and aircraft on German border towns. None of these accusations were true. That evening, as Grey stood gazing out of one of the windows of the Foreign Office, watching the gas lamps being lit, he is supposed to have said, The lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. In the next lecture, we'll consider events on the last day of the crisis. Tuesday, August the 4th. See you then.